This is Peter Helland with Gus Silke on the show Israel. And we're going to look at war. War is a big thing right now in the Ukraine. And the scriptures that, to me, deal right with it. <clears throat> Old Testament in Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 4, verse 4. Then I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from, one's per from one person's envy of another. In the New Testament, it says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. Um, <clears throat> We've been talking before about Senator Nye, mm -hmm. and he was the head of the committee after World War I in America to, to, to investigate why we even went into World War I, which is mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of like, <laughs> didn't you guys know why you went into the war? And he came back and he said, well, basically it was um, the armaments industry, or we would say the military industrial complex uh, had already built up enough momentum mm -hmm. to push us into that war. Well, I've been looking at my, we called him Uncle Walter, okay, but it'd be my mom's uncle. And my grandmother only had one sibling. And he was like, like in another world to us, because he had, he was like the old look with the, you know, like you see those pictures in the 1910s with the cane and the, in the mustache, you know, that real aristocratic look. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that's what he was. But he was from Chicago, like my grandmother, just the two of them, and went to University of Illinois. And by the time he's 18, he's already part of the Chemical Warfare Service, World War I. Somehow, he must have been involved in chemistry. And then he moved, goes on and gets his PhD in chemistry at Harvard. And if you do a little digging, now none of my family's ever talked about him on any of this, partly because everything was so secret. Mm -hmm. Okay, when it, come to the, it comes to the military, it is very secret. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we just never knew. So you, you have to like dig in. But I'm interested in this because what's the connection between Harvard? science and war, okay? And, and I don't doubt his integrity. I mean, my sister, we, we just think, like my grandmother was considered by everybody in, the, everybody in our family is like a saint, and he was like, like her. They were both very, I mean, you just, if they came in the room, you go, woo. I mean, you better start behaving, because they, they just poured, you know how that was, but people were that way. But he's the same age as James Conant, who also got a PhD in chemistry. And Conant was the president of Harvard, even president of Harvard during World War II. Mm -hmm. Okay. And James Conant, this is up, this is up your alley. James Conant uh, was like Theodore Hesburgh. He was never on campus, and they were very upset at him because he spent five, well, what I'm reading, he spent five days a week in Washington, D.C. working on the atomic bomb project. And reading a little bit further, he, suppose what I'm reading, he encouraged Truman to use the atomic bomb and bomb civilians in Japan for the effect. Now, Harvard is a seminary, okay? Harvard was created by the Puritans around 1650 as a, as a straight conservative seminary. When you were at um, Notre Dame, you had um, a teacher, mm -hmm. freshman year. Mm -hmm. uh, what was his name? Stan Hauerwas. Stan Hauerwas. He, yeah. he, at one time, he was on the front cover of Time magazine. He's very well known. Yeah. And what did he tell you at freshman year about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, whether it was that, uh, was that, I mean, here's James Conant, president of Harvard, 
telling Truman this is what you need to do. Was there any moral problem with doing that? Um, well, to Howard Wass, that was a war crime. Now, uh, and of course, there's, there's a debate in American society about that issue, and there's a debate in academia about that issue. But I was taught by a theologian who taught me that that was a war crime because it had to do with direct killing of civilians. Well, uh, Con no, Condit argued because of the surprise attack by the Japs on Pearl Harbor, they were justified to do that. Uh, that seems uh, a weak justification because even the attack on Pearl Harbor was on military targets. There weren't a lot of civilians that died in Pearl Harbor. A lot of military, 3,000 military there people died. There was very died. little military uh, target in, in Hiroshima. But, but, going, but anyway. Yeah, no, I, I think that that distinction is what fell apart at the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It, the, the most famous quote about that was from Fulton Sheen, who said, uh, everything changed at 8.15 in the morning on August 6, 1945. And he looked around and he said, do you know what that means? Do you know what happened then? That's when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. He said, what happened there? I'm paraphrasing it, but this is close. What happened there is all the distinctions got erased. The distinction between military and civilian, the distinction between combatants and non-combatants, and... Uh, people just said they were going to do what they wanted to do. But, he, but, here, but here, and, and that that sheer will kind of uh, approach to uh, life. Uh, I want to do what I want to do. I want it my way. Uh, played out very deeply in our society, according to Sheen. At that well, point, well, I'm, I'm looking at a letter that Conant wrote. Yeah, because he he was he was in, basically he was in charge of a lot. There's a guy named Groves in the military, but as far as on the other level, civilian level, he was very much in charge of that atomic bomb program, the Manhattan Project. Played a big role. So he's hiring somebody, and I'm seeing the letter, and you can get on the internet and see a lot. And the letter is saying, okay, now you're going to be working in Division 9, and that was run, that was the chemistry division uh, in the department that was overseeing the Manhattan Project. That was, the Manhattan Project was under it. And that division was run by my great uncle. And you will be under him. But the question is, now I talked to my cousin who lived next to grandma out, out, out east. And he, she said, well, grandma said that he regretted some of the, you know. So it seems like the decision to bomb the civilians did not come from people like necessarily people like my my great uncle. That was a decision being made by an elite group. Okay, um, so the people that there was one hundred thirty thousand people involved in the Manhattan Project. Okay, so and it was and it was deceptive because the argument was well Hitler's trying to make one. But I think Niels Bohr's, but they already knew that that he had given up. So they were using that as a propaganda piece. So in other words, why is America a powerful empire? Would it be a powerful empire if we didn't have the atomic bomb? I mean, in other words, how much power to our empire does do these weapons give us? And, and not only that. My uh, great uncle, I also noticed, was was the head of the chemical, because because he was in World War One already in the chemical warfare service at eighteen. By the time World War Two came, he's the head of the chemical warfare division. Why wouldn't he be? I mean, he went to Harvard and got a PhD, so he's already involved. And then he was the head of the chemical biological warfare. Uh, committee. See, so, and, and the employees for that were just up next to the atomic bomb. So that's 130,000 for the atomic bomb. The chemical warfare section of our uh, military was huge. 
So you think these bio labs in U Ukraine are just a fluke? It's, it's, it's the deep part of the military industrial complex and has been. And, and the idea was, well, if they attack us with stuff, we got to be ready to attack them. Okay. Okay. In other words, we have an atomic bomb. We're not supposed to use it unless we are attacked or something like that. Isn't that the idea? But mm -hmm. we, we, we did it to Japan. They didn't hit us with an atomic bomb. So, so what's, in other words, what's directing this country? You have the president of Harvard directly involved the atomic bomb project and, t Truman, and encouraging Truman to bomb the civilians. What kind of theology, what kind of morals are directing this nation at the highest level already way back then? Well, I think that uh, one of the things that Merton points out in his book on uh, war is that World War II started out uh, and they wanted to abide by the Geneva rules. And then they, they both, both sides started to really cheat. And uh, 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 what, what happened is, is there was this ramping up of atrocity that occurred as the war wore on. And uh, so by the time you hit 1945, you know, it was like Fulton Sheen said, anything goes. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think that, that uh, that's, that's what, war gets out of control. War is insane and absurd, ultimately, I think. And, and I think, as I think about war, uh, I think all wars really depend on lies. On, uh, and the lies are couched in uh, narratives that seem always seem half true. Well, the, re the reason we but got that, this... And that's a problem. The reason we're doing the show, because my cousin said, well, you ought to do a show on this. But, yeah. but what she was referring to was an article how they, they used deception in the atomic bomb program. In other words, from what we can see, Conant, my... Uncle, call him my uncle. They were organic chemists, okay. And chemical warfare was was what was outlawed, okay. And the atomic bomb project was called the uranium project or something. You know, it was referred to as S one uranium. You know, uranium two thirty five, uranium two thirty eight, and they were going to try to mm -hmm. break that atom. And well, uranium is an element. That's chemistry, right? Did you? Well, now you're taking me as a religion teacher beyond my. Uh, I'm saying uh, I believe this my article was saying it was yeah. fundamentally a chemistry project. Right, I got that. Okay, and and that's an interesting one of these classic questions of how history actually transpired, and uh, uh, what you're saying is that there are some historians or some historical accounts that claim that uh, they were kind of using physics as a... Uh, Nuclear physics is a misleading term. Well, it was, it's, it's, it's chemistry. It's actual study. Yeah, it's chemistry. They, they needed them both, Peter. But, 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 but physics got around the Geneva Convention. They didn't have, law, they didn't have rules against physics uh, uh, okay. warfare. It was against chemical warfare. Okay, I, I mean, so I, just label it something else, right? Well, and it, and that that's an interesting thesis, and I would have to know more science to be able to sort it out. I've also I'm just saying read. this is how wars are fought by deception. Okay, I got that constantly, okay. a, a, always I, a lie on everything you do, and then when they go into peacetime, they keep it up. Yeah, truth is the first casualty of war, Winston Churchill. And unless the people hold the government official, but how are you going to hold them? Once you're in the war, are you going to hold them accountable for telling a lie in the middle of the war? Um, that's going to be tough. And what is the Christian ethics on lying in war? Nobody wants to t tackle that? 
Um, what does Stan Hauerwas say about that? Well, no, he, uh, Stan Hauerwas was, was absolutely uh, strict on any form of lying. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really? Mean, oh, yes. Uh, but that uh, is not something Americans think, well, what's wrong with lying? I mean, can't you exaggerate? I mean, can't you tell a white lie? Well, how are you going to ever sell anything if you can't lie a little bit? Well, the, I, I mean, I think the thing is that it is true that um, what, another thing Churchill said was that in wartime, the truth is protected by an army of lies around it. That's a good one. That, uh, he did say that, too. So those are two sayings from Churchill that are helpful here. Uh, uh, the truth is the first casualty of war. And in during war, the truth is protected by uh, an army of lies. Oh, yeah. Lies so when the war is it. over, they go back to telling the truth then? Well, no, I don't know. I, I guess that's the other problem is that once people establish habits of a mind, of a mindset, they have a very hard time breaking out of that. Yeah, because yeah, you, you're going to justify telling a lie again, even in peacetime. Well, I'm, I'm justified now. Well, why maybe you'd be justified again? Well, and uh, see, the thing is, is that, is that, as the expression goes, oh, oh, what a tangled net we weave when first we practice to deceive. In other words, once, uh, once you've got lies, then you have what you call like the fog of war. Well, let, let, let's, From let's, there, uh, moral behavior becomes very, very difficult. Let's look at that scripture. Okay. Yeah. Then I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from one's, one person's envy of another. Okay, and then we and then it talks about, you know, war. When, where come where do wars come? They come from your lust. Okay, that war in your members, and a lot of the lust is competing with other people. Okay, right. But but it says you you ask, you have not because you ask not. So it's basically saying, where's your prayer life with God? Where's your relationship with God? Can't you get things from God? Well, isn't He your source? No, when God is no longer your source. As, a, as an individual or as a nation, now you're going to, it's going to move you to be more grasping. Right. Now you're going to try to get things, not from God, you're going to get them yourself. Right. I, I mean, uh, I think uh, uh, between the analysis of Rene Girard and John Dunn here is, is very helpful. Because for Rene Girard, desire uh, is imitative or competitive. He called it mimetic desire. And that's what that passage in uh, Ecclesiastes is talking about, mimetic desire. People doing things out of competition and envy. And, and they just they want to keep up with the Joneses and so on. Um, but there's a deeper level of desire, according to John Donne, called heart's desire, which goes deeper than mimetic desire. It's not imitative. It's, 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 it goes deeper into the core of the person, and it's planted there by God. Okay? But when you have a whole nation, yeah. the government is godless. Okay? That's just, that's just, we know what it is. It's a godless constitution, federal constitution. And these guys are not calling on God. Okay? And therefore, what are they doing? You know, it says women, uh, children will oppress, women will rule, and the leaders will lead astray. You know, Isaiah 3. So everybody knows this thing is, everybody feels this thing's falling apart. Isn't that what a lot of people are feeling? Yeah, I, I've sensed that in my conversations with people. They can't look at things that, years ago would have been easy to look at, okay? That, I mean, one example of this is, for example, the Ukraine. Back in the late 1980s, my mother purchased this book for me, The Harvest of Sorrow by Robert Conquest. This is about the, uh, 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 what they called the Holodomor, which was the... Uh, the, the mass starvation of the Ukrainian peasantry 
in the 1930s in the Soviet Union. And when was that book written? Uh, well, this book is uh, copyright 1986. Oh, so he, she got it when it came out. Yeah, she got it when it came out, oh. and she knew that I was interested in this part of history, so I read it. But again, it, it's, like, it's like, does anybody take the time to step back and ask some fundamental questions about what's going on, or are they just led by these very, very emotive uh, news reports that, you know, it's like everybody finds out about Ukraine in late February of 2022, and no one knew anything about Ukraine prior to that. Well, I, I, I've been following Ukraine since the 1980s, and I'm not, I'm not a geopolitical expert. I'm a religion teacher. But what, what I'm saying is, is, that, is that this is very troubling to me because I see people going off what I consider to be half-cocked, you know, the expression having to do with uh, the misuse of a gun. It's like uh, people are, are, uh, are just relying on very, very, uh, I consider them to be dangerous half-truth narratives well, if you that are pushing us toward uh, the brink of a catastrophic war with Russia. Well, you can't count on the government being moral or telling the truth. And you can't count on the Harvards being moral or telling you the truth. Well, who so, can so, we count on then? I mean, we're supposed to be able to count. You're going to have to count on yourself well, and count on uh, your friends and maybe your local church uh, trying to talk things through. But your politician's not going to tell you the truth. Well, a lot of my friends uh, have a hard time with all this. Um, uh, they're not able to uh, uh, go beyond the uh, common narrative. Right. So nobody can. No, in other words, you, mean, can't they're, find they're, any, you can't find any local people that can tackle this. I, the government's going to lie almost all the time, and they're going to be immoral. <sighs> and the universities are going to lie and be immoral. Well, so where where is where is the remnant? Well, and that is a darn good question. Well, I, the way I've looked at the whole Ukraine thing, and I told people on Facebook, check with John Mearsheimer, check with the uh, videos of Stephen Cohen, who, who was originally from Princeton, and he's a Russia expert. Listen to Mearsheimer. Listen to Cohen. Listen to interesting. You can hear it from Noam Chomsky or you can hear it from Henry Kissinger. Those two guys are about as far apart as you can imagine on every political spectrum. But they both tell you the truth about Ukraine. And listen to what George Kennan said in, in 1991. By that time, he was quite an old man, right? But he's the guy who wrote the famous uh, cable I think, I think they called it the nine-page cable, where he instructed the State Department what to do about communism in the late 1940s. Okay, but can you, okay. He, he engaged the, the containment policy, and when he saw what was happening in the early 90s, he warned the Americans that if you don't stop pushing toward Russia with the expansion of NATO... You're going to end up with a new Cold War or worse. That's what, that's what Kennan said. So, you know, we've had our wise men warn us here. But you're saying you, we just can't jump in. you got to know, like, this history. you got to know can't something we go, can't about Can't we go it? back to Gen, uh, uh, Senator Nye and, and figure out what's the foundation before Hitler? What was happening? Right. This is be the harvest of sorrow is before Hitler. It was in the night. Uh, well, I mean, but that was still a result of the Bolshevik Revolution, correct? And war, which was a result of World, World War One. That's correct. So the thing is that is that you have to. Um, and you, Anthony Sutton, you know him. Yeah, yeah, right. He had a whole thesis about the uh, the way the communists were supported by a lot of business people in America. That's right. what his. Yes. That was his uh, thesis. I understand that. Um, so in other words, in other words we're, we're a guilty party in creating the Bolshevik Revolution, okay? We're a guilty party. It was America, a big group of Americans helping to support the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, 
Okay, which then those evil people went and caused the Ukrainians to starve to death, millions of them, right? Correct. That was, I mean, it was the, uh, it was uh, Solzhenitsyn, uh, some people uh, call him Solzhenitsyn. Um, I remember that debate when I was a kid. But Alexander Solzhenitsyn, is what we say, uh, he said, um, it's, the, it's up to now the least researched uh, crime of the Leninist, Stalinist communism. It's war against the peasantry. Okay. Right. So if you were a victim of that, or you had you were part of a clan or a family oh, that was a victim, victim of that. that, you would want to know how did this happen? Well, a bunch of a lot of Americans helped support the Bolshevik Revolution, and overtook the bulk of the of the ethnic people of Russia. Right. Okay. A small little elite group. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and a lot of them were Jewish. Okay. I don't know the percentage. Okay, and these are things you're, you know, well, you don't say this in polite company. Okay, well, the New Testament says for fear of the Jews, <laughs> that's what, that was what was happening, for fear of the Jews. But anyway, they then, that small little group, terrorized the Ukrainians. Yes, well. And, and, and many of them uh, starved to death. And yeah, now the, and, and the Ukrainians story, yeah. are, are some forgave some haven't forgiven some are out for revenge right there's a mix there's a mixed thing and and so let's step up to the current situation in the ukraine and let me tell you one of the things i have mentioned in one of my side conversations on facebook uh discussing this with a scholar friend of mine um the 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 problem is that when you have a uh a country that's severely divided, and Ukraine is. Uh, between, well, we're divided too. I understand that. We'll start with Ukraine. But when you have that, what you don't do is go into the situation and try to take advantage of the divisions. What you do instead is you work to build peace, to build relationships, peace building. Hmm. Like, you know, and... The uh, my sense is is that many of the Americans that interacted with the Ukraine were not that interested in what I would call peace building. They were they were rather interested in ideologically uh, 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 stirring up people, and uh, uh, they managed to do it. I mean. We, we have that uh, coup that occurred in 2014, and uh, there's a lot of indications that there were people uh, be, that uh, supported that coup um, who uh, have a visceral hatred of Russians. They're, they're, it's an irrational No, is this hatred. because of what happened in the, in the whole of... Uh, oh, it could have been... Uh, well, it could have been the whole of the war. It could have been other things... That other historical for whatever reasons, but things, but it, but the point is, is that you uh, and I heard uh, uh, E. Michael Jones say this, so I'm not going to claim that I I said it. It's what he said. He said that um, if you if you're sitting at the negotiating table and somebody's grandfather was uh, persecuted or or uh, harmed by the people you're negotiating with, the negotiations are going to look different. Then, if you have like a ordinary negotiator sitting there, like George Kennan, who didn't have a dog in the fight, and he could make a rational assessment of how to how to sort out the interests of the country, yeah. And and I think that's a very good insight. And well, it's worth thinking about and pondering well, in regards in the, to in this. the Old Testament. You had cities of refuge, right? That was a that for, was a for, way of dealing with it. In other words, if you. Yeah accidentally murdered somebody even mm -hmm. though you're really innocent according to the normal law mm -hmm. uh, the family still wants to kill you right so you have to go to a place where they can't in other kill words you. God, it's assumed of course they want to kill you right doesn't matter if you're innocent you killed one of their own and, and it was and an now, accident and they want yeah. to kill you right well and God just ex ex expects yeah that's how people are going to feel okay right. well what do you think about if you had relatives 
either murdered under Stalin in, in Russia right. or in Ukraine. They're going to want to get revenge. It could be the great grandfather. Right. And, and yeah, and, and uh, these revenge things last for a long time, like the Hatfields and the McCoys. This is, it's just stroke and counterstroke constantly. And then the people later on don't even know why they're fighting. But, the, but it, it went back to that sense of revenge, I think. And, and so, uh, so much in, in the Bible really is about breaking the cycle of revenge. Mm -hmm. Even the, the, at, in the beginning of Genesis, you had that, um, the mark of Cain. What was God doing? He was protecting Cain from revenge, mm -hmm. okay? I, I, that's, that's really important. I mean, and you see that, that the covenant is being worked out by God through uh, time in uh, Genesis to, to undo violence. And, and, and that's, you know, uh, that's a part of the story. Well, okay? that's, that's why Jesus said, if, you, if yeah. you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. So basically, you want to go to heaven? Here's the condition. Yeah, it's, you better be forgiven. Well, everything in you does not want to do that. Right. I mean, I mean, it, it takes a lot of energy and uh, uh, willingness to let go of vengeance. Um, my uh, uh, one of my Jewish friends uh, uh, says that uh, revenge is a lazy form of grief. In other words. And that's good. That's, that's a good uh, step in the right direction. Revenge is a lazy form of grief. In other words, you get grieved, you're sorry, you're sad, and then you give in to the power of that sadness, and suddenly you're vengeful. And if, uh, so the remedy to that is to get moving and, and build something up. Do some peace building. See? The, the, you know, and it's hard. It's it's a narrow way. But let's, I, let's go back and look and review this. So, in other words, the, the Bolsheviks uh, persecuted and murdered by starvation, primarily in the Ukraine, millions. Yes. The Nazis come in. Right. The Nazis. Or the Wehrmacht or whoever, you know. Right. The Nazis were the small element, the SSers, but, but a lot of them, probably 80% was the Wehrmacht, right? They come through. Right. And they're seen as liberators. By some of those people, right? Yeah, it was seen that way, and I mean, I mean, this is a good example. Um, the famous um, pro-Palestinian um, Jewish professor Norman Finkelstein, his parents were uh, in the uh, Holocaust. I mean, they were they they lived through it. Okay, okay, but they were liberated by Stalin. Okay, they were because the Russians, you know, came. The Germans had set up a, a camp, a work camp or whatever. Yeah, and, and they were part of that work camp or... Uh, uh, Concentration camp, camp work, work camp, camp, I mean, camp. however we you... don't know. Yeah, we're not I mean, going to... We're not... That's not the issue here. What, what Some other historians have to handle that one. But what, what uh, Norman Finkelstein be, it was a very pro-communist person when he was growing up because his parents were grateful to Stalin for liberating them, okay? Now, play that one in Appleton, Wisconsin, where, where I grew up. Uh, that would be kind of a, a hard sell, because we were very anti-communist growing up. But the, but the thing is, is that these things are context-dependent, uh, and I, I could understand why Norman Finkelstein's parents we're grateful to the Russians that liberated the work camps. I can. Well, yeah. Well, there's people. So, in... so, 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 again. So, in the Ukraine, there was some of the same kind of dynamic. And I'm not defending the uh, uh, pro uh, 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 the pro Nazi people well, in the you, Ukraine. You also know, but I'm also not. I'm saying when you when you have a polity made up of all these different. Uh, Con, uh, convergences of, of um, uh, uh, populations, uh, you have the duty to build peace and not further divide people with hardened ideology. And that's what I see, that's what I see had happened. 
and 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 it was it was like they they these people from the west thought they should poke the bear and they just kept poking and what's the bear going to do ultimately it's, it's going to respond well going back to the other i've met people here from poland lived under communism and they said it was better okay than than here mm. and people from ukraine it was better under communism for various reasons okay that can happen right and so when we your dad went to Poland, right? Yes. To help after after uh, uh, he retired. Yeah. yeah, and after communism had uh, right. fallen, you know, drifted away or whatever, and so he helped reestablish. But a lot of people were not happy with capitalism taking over. That's true, and it, and it, it wasn't that they were necessarily communists. They might have been in Poland. They were Catholic. And they were looking for a third way between communism and and uh, sheer neoliberal capitalism. That and and so that's a, another element. In other words, after yeah. communists fell, we brought in some yeah. bad stuff. Came in there, didn't they? I, I mean, I Larry think Summers so. from Harvard didn't he? Get uh, some of these people brought in things that weren't that helpful. Uh, and uh, I mean, it comes under the heading of Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. They weren't. It, at, at times, uh, these uh, they were carpet beggars. They, you know, we were like carpet beggars going in there. Well, it? some were, I guess. I, I'm not. Uh, uh, I mean, after all, my dad did. He started a commercial bank in Krakow. That's the home city of Pope John Paul II. But they invited him over. They because invited him over because they wanted they wanted the development of capitalism. It's a funny story about that. I mean, we met with the cardinal of Krakow, and my dad says, I understand you know the Pope. And the guy... Is that how your dad said it? That's how he said it to the cardinal of Krakow. And the cardinal looked at him and he says, yes, Mr. Zilke, but the Pope knows me. That's a great line. <laughs> and... At the, toward the end of the conversation with my father, Your dad really liked that one. I bet. Oh, my dad loved it. He said, <laughs> "He said, you know, every cab driver in Krakow knows the Pope, but does the Pope know them? You know." I mean, <laughs> uh, but then there was the the other uh, moment of interesting conversation was when the uh, the cardinal asked my father what he thought of the economy and the situation in Poland. And my dad got this painful look on his face, and he says, I think it's going to take like 10 years to turn this economy around. And the, the Cardinal Archbishop looked at my father and said, oh, we, to have such optimism. <laughs> well, yeah, you're laughing because you know that a, a, an American businessman is not going to ever say anything beyond 10 years. Ten years is like the furthest out projection, and my dad was still wincing when he said it. And uh, to my to the Cardinal Archbishop of uh, Krakow, that was a optimistic prediction. It turned out my father was right. Yep. The, the economy popped back in Poland in about ten years after that visit. So I mean, but regardless of that. But anyway, know, getting getting back. I'm sorry to. No, no, no. But getting yeah. back to. I'm interested yeah. in my my um, uncle. Yeah. Uh, you got the bio labs in America. I was you know the, the chemical biological uh, program that America's right. had is huge. There was 130,000 people that were employed for the Manhattan Project, but the chemical biological programs are huge. I didn't get the numbers, but they're they're way up there. It's it's an integral part of our military industrial complex. Okay, it goes back to the Civil War. Okay, so we're dealing with a military industrial complex. Right. That, that is overwhelming everything. And the two main components that I see is the nuclear program and the chemical biological program. And, well, that's, and that's our strength. That's yeah. what we use to intimidate the world. Isn't, isn't that, is that true? I, I, it, it seems to be very true. I mean, that amazing moment when Victoria Nuland was being interviewed by uh, Marco Rubio in the Senate hearing, 
and he simply asked, are there what are there biological what does the Ukraine have biological weapons and she said uh, well we do we have uh, we have laboratories in Ukraine and we're hoping the Russians don't get to them he, she said something like that right mm -hmm. and it's like wow because the, the UN lady uh, denied it the black lady that's our, our ambassador in the UN denied it right and so uh, other fact checkers were denying what Victoria Nuland had said, but she's the Under Secretary of State for Ukraine. She's an expert on Ukraine from the State Department uh, side of things, and she was involved in the whole uh, work of getting Ukraine new leadership uh, after the coup because of that phone call that uh, got uh, uh, released uh, where she was discussing who was going to lead Ukraine uh, next in 2014. So she knows, okay? And well, they she, couldn't have. They got rid of. The she's new under oath, so she tells this, and uh, uh, that, uh, yeah. So so that's going on. I mean, it, yeah. And uh, well, the, the, I don't know what to make of all that. Well, they got they got they they made a deal that they would they would get rid of their nuclear. Um, yeah, that, that weapons, was a, right. Well, yeah, that was the deal that uh, Richard Luger but was being agree, involved but in. But they didn't agree on the chemical biological warfare level. Perhaps. I, I, well, there probably was, didn't agree. There so were, now they're, they're going to now we're going <laughs> to if we can't go by nuclear, we're going to strengthen our chemical biological method of warfare, uh, which potentially. Well, look at the Wuhan lab. I mean, look, you know, look, look at the COVID. Yeah, I think I most... Mean, look, look at the effect that's had. Well, most scientists that I've uh, trusted uh, do believe it was uh, man-made. It, it was, bi it was chemical made. biological warfare. Yeah, that, that's what they say. I, again, well, why I'm out of my Hold expertise. Here, they, we got them every... What? We got the amount of money, the amount of personnel... If it was just a little bit less than the Manhattan Project, which was 130,000 people, and the biological war, has anybody investigated uh, how much did we put into that? How many people are involved in that and we're never going to use it? It's only if they do it. it, it we don't have, you know, we're, we're, are we just waiting for that to attack us? This is, what, this is their th idea. Well, we got to be able to, if they attack us, then we'll use it. Or would we attack without being attacked? Uh, and can the Russians trust NATO? And can they trust Ukraine having these type of weapons right next to them? Do they feel like trusting them? Um, there's a lot of complicated issues there. Well, this is the tension. Yeah, I got Putin it. Putin feels he has a duty to protect his people. Yeah, yeah, I know that's that's the argument. I my, most of my friends don't believe that, Peter. Or oh, doesn't he have a duty to protect them? Oh, I I, I didn't say that. I, I meant they don't they don't see Putin as the proper protector of the Russian people. But the, uh, he's got a. Uh, I mean, he, that's. He, I'm 80, just telling you what my friends are saying. Eighty-three percent. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but uh, somebody was just saying that the people that are voting for Putin, supporting him. Oh, in Russia. Is eighty-three percent. Okay. Maybe it's not. Okay. Maybe it's seventy, but apparently it's over fifty. Right. And and where's Biden? I don't know. Thirty-three percent. So you, so in other words, we have thirty-three percent supporting our leader here. They have 83% over there, and we're the democracy people. You know, we're, the, we're like the, the main democracy people of the, of the universe. Okay. It's a complicated mess. Well, this part's not complicated. Well, okay. If they have 83% supporting them, by our democratic principles, we're supposed to accept that as God. The voice of the people is the voice of God. So the voice of the people in Russia pretty much support Putin. And how, so how can we be against Putin when 83% when say, yeah, we're behind him. He's doing our bidding. Um, Based on our principles.
I think the uh, uh, the way they're looking at it is quite a bit different because for them history started in February of 2022. And oh, when, if, when Putin invaded? Yes, that that's all that people can see. Why why do the Russians hate the word invaded? They they do not want to I mean they don't want to call it an invasion. So how do you def, def, can you Cross over and, and pass defend. over. Yeah, well, can you pass over and def and defend the Russian people? The eighty three percent that support Putin. Can you pass over and defend uh, what they're doing? Well, I'm not the right one to ask. But uh, if I made an effort to pass over to what the Russian people are thinking, um, that's their soft underbelly there, under where the Ukraine is. It's right next door. It would be like if. Russia or China started to change the government of Mexico and put um, all kinds of uh, armed people in Mexico to uh, attack uh, maybe a certain group of Americans. This is Max Blumenthal, what he said, and he used it as an example. Um, and what would we do? What would we do if, if uh, 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 of course, we have what we call the Monroe Doctrine, which means that nobody is going to interfere with the entire hemisphere that we live in, okay? That's the Monroe Doctrine. And do we have a right to say that? Uh, or we're just going to say it? Well, it's, 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 this is a, an example where custom might have the power of law because we've been living under the Monroe Doctrine for a very long time. Okay. And so... Uh, 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 you might argue that, that that custom has the power of law. I don't know. I'm not an international relations expert either. But what I, I can see by analogy, because I know something about analogy, is that, is that, what the heck? If there was a problem like that in Mexico, um, uh, I think we would respond. We, we would probably respond in a similar manner or even harsher than uh, Putin did. Well, the Ukrainian, the, the Ukrainian leader of their church, Ukrainian Orthodox, called Putin the Antichrist. Okay. So you got some hard feelings. Well, and, and Putin is like that with the Russian patriarch, the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church. Right. He supports Putin. So now you're calling each other Satan, Antichrist. Well, this is not... And then you want to let them have bio lab after bio lab? Well, I and then all kinds of missile. Who knows what else they're doing? They're bringing in right, right. I mean, we don't know. I mean, one thing about bringing arms to that uh, conflict, I I noticed that Chris Hedges really, really condemned that. And Chris Hedges is a Pulitzer Prize winning war correspondent. But he got fired by the New York Times because he stood up against the uh, 2003 Iraqi incursion that uh, the United States did. And because he did, he lost his job. And he's been sort of uh, pushed aside ever since. He's become a minister on top of that. Oh, nice. Interesting guy, Chris Hedges. But he, he said increasing arms, sending arms into the Ukraine to fight Russia is like telling the Ukrainians to, it's, it's suicide. It's like, it's like, wait a second, um, don't you think that uh, negotiating a settlement would be a better deal to keep people from dying? That, that's basically what Chris said. Well, I, I, I tend to defer to Chris because he was such a good war correspondent and he, knew, he knows how to uh, parse these things. He spent a lot of time in the, the Balkan War and then he, then he, he also can speak Arabic. And so, you know, he knew the situation well, in the Middle East. In theory, in theory, the people that are supporting Putin, if the Ukrainians didn't fight back, right, what would Putin be doing? If they didn't fight back, what would he have done? Because, he, because once they start fighting back, then it's a whole different, I mean. Right. Well, but what, what was his objective? His objective, if I understand it correctly, uh, was to neutralize, uh, make, force, basically force neutrality 
He's forcing neutrality on Ukraine. He doesn't want Ukraine to have a built-up military so that they can't attack Russia. That's the, I, the and and that's and they my had, understanding. And they, had, and they were supposed to be that way, right? Wasn't that was it? Weren't they? Well, there were people in the Ukraine who had hoped that that was going to be the case, but there were other people who wanted to fight Russia. So you know that that's uh, that's the mixture of, of the population there. But they did. Do they want to fight Russia because of the bad feelings from the Holodomor? I think some of it is that. I think. Some of it came afterwards from uh, the different things that they had to go through under the Soviet Union later. I mean, uh, uh, and some of it is just uh, resentment of the more powerful neighbor. I, I mean, you can, who knows? I don't but know. But they're both Slavic people. Right. Whereas Austria is not Slavic. Oh, I see. Yeah. I mean, I mean and then Hungary is right there. Right. Hungary is not Slavic. Right. I mean, these are different people, but they're the same people. Right. Which makes it a little more. Well, it's a, they're, they're tighter. That, well, the, the, this is brother see, the against brother. Yeah. No. And, and of course, Ukraine had something of a, a, a war going on in there uh, fighting the uh, Russian-speaking people in the East. Donbass. Yeah, Donbass. and all that for, for eight years. And they tried with the Minsk agreements and then this other agreement that was drawn up by the German foreign minister. And they killed and they, they 14, were 14,000 people were killed? Yes, uh, over time. And the uh, uh, part of the reason the Russians went in, according to what one of the accounts I read, is that they were massing a bigger army there close to the Donbass, and the, the Russians took a look at that and said, we better uh, take care of that. No. I mean, that, now, I, I don't know that. That's just, I mean, the, the fog of war makes the details of this very difficult right. to parse. But, but I want to keep resurrecting the question. You know Senator Nye. Yeah, he I was knew appointed Senator to Nye. The, he was appointed on the committee. He was World the head War of the I. committee. He was the head of it to investigate why we went into World War I. Yeah. And he said what? Uh, it was uh, it was promoted by munitions uh, interest interest, and they were colluding too with the some of the bankers too, uh, yeah. the, inter the big banks. Well, it was is, is it, it that what's going? I mean, isn't that what Eisenhower said? It's you know it's the military industrial complex. Yeah. It's the same collusion. So what, what what's motivating America? To, to be doing what we're doing over in Europe with NATO in Ukraine. What's, what's our motivation? Is it a, is it a military-industrial complex motivation again? There's got to be some of that. And my, the best example I have of it, go back to the Trump administration. And Trump, right after he got elected, he went over to Saudi Arabia. Remember that? <clears throat> and he did that, like that sword dance mm -hmm. with the... With the and, uh, when they asked him about this, uh, remember that Saudi Arabia has been supporting an incredibly... Uh, 300,000 people have died in Yemen. That's, in how, that, that's how many? Yes. 300,000. 300,000. <laughs> so Yemen makes the Ukraine look like a picnic. I hate to say it. And I know my friends are going to be really offended. Well, we've been when, to meetings on that. And we, we went to that meeting from the Indiana Center for... Middle East peace mm -hmm. uh, in Fort Wayne, yep. and we heard about the Ukraine. I mean, I'm sorry, the Yemen, Yemen. See right. <laughs> all these war zones, and yeah, you were there. You asked good questions, as you always do. <laughs> they're kind of tough, but they're good questions. Um, but the point was, is that, uh, but they asked Trump, "What are we doing here in Saudi Arabia?" And you know what he said? I can't and, remember. Jobs, jobs, jobs. <laughs> I'm bringing all these jobs to make all these weapons back to the United States. Well, hold it here. Hold it here. I'm, That's you know, what he said. I'm, you know, I'm a German major, and I lived in right. Austria for a year. Yeah. And I talked to a lot of people, Germans, you know, I had all the time right, to travel. Right. They loved Hitler. And, and why, why did they love him? One, you know, the basic answer was... We had no job. Hitler come in. We all have jobs. It was great. 
Well, I'm not. And I mean, I'm just saying. You're not, you're not, by saying that, you're not saying that Trump was a Hitler. But the, but the, the sad thing of, of this whole thing is that we're all slaves to this military industrial complex. And we've got to get free. We got to get free of the ideology of war. But but you it's have going to kill but, us all. Right, but you have That's my concern. But you have Harvard as an integral part of it. You have Notre Dame. Well, that that uh, has professors that write books justifying the bombing of Hiroshima. And they have Department of Defense units at Notre Dame all throughout that campus. Okay, you got people donating money. What was, that, what was that guy's name? George? I don't know what his name was. You know, here, here's 70 million. You know, these, that's the biggest donation that's ever been given to Notre Dame by one family, right? Yeah, and he said, you know, and they also said, donated, national security. Yeah, that's what it was for. National security. So, okay. so Notre Dame, in a sense, in half, at least halfway, was taken over by the Navy in World War II. We kind of, that's kind of like assumed, you know, so there's a strong connection between these universities, Harvard, Notre Dame, and you know, uh, and then they give justification. The president, Conant, the president of Harvard, yeah, bomb those civilians, bomb not Hiroshima. That would be the right thing to do. Well, Truman's going to take that and run with it. And then you got professors at Notre Dame. Oh yeah, that was bombing Hiroshima. That was a great thing. I'm just, uh, I'm just saying, but. I wasn't taught that at Notre Dame, so I, I must object. Right, but we know t people at Notre Dame that do teach that. Well, uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. So you're saying, how are we going to solve this problem? Well, if, if the military-industrial complex keeps finding justifications for their wars by the universities, uh, <laughs> no, they need to be condemned when they need to be condemned. No, I, I agree with the, this. Uh, There's a moment that this very angry uh, correspondent was interviewing the Chinese uh, ambassador to the United States. I don't know. We got one minute now. Oh. <laughs> and all he said was, condemnation is not where we need to go here. We need to deal with this thing with wisdom. And I thought, wow, that's a good answer. Even though, you know, it came from the Chinese ambassador. Hmm. I, I mean, we need to deal with things with wisdom, and uh, we need to pray for wisdom. We need to ask the Lord to show us what we need to be in our hearts, in our minds, and in our politics for peace. I, I mean, there's, I could have said a lot about it, but we, the problem was we got into the, um, the minutiae of the um, history and the, uh, the problems in Ukraine, and we never got to the solution, which is a big problem. The, but the solution... Well, it's, I mean, hey, look, we read look, it. You, I, you have not because you asked not. P Peter, the solution, put it in the show notes. Have people watch my video from uh, uh, summer of 2019 on Kennedy and Khrushchev and the Cuban Missile Crisis and how they solved it. Okay, we'll put it on there. Put it on the show notes and so okay. people can watch that and okay. get, a, get a hint about a solution. Okay, so we got to end. So this is uh, Gus Silke, Peter Helland on the show Israel.